If you went to Whitfield School, will you stand up and I'm going to have Andrew take your picture. It's all of us that went to Whitfield School here. Oh, there's a lot. Thank you. All the way from Tennessee. And probably our oldest one is Paul, I forget your last name, Bognick. <laughs> and he went to Whitfield in the 40s. Well, I did too. Wow. I did too. So that was before I was born. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it's thrilling to see so many people here that loved loved, loved our school, Whitfield. This is a picture of the school that I hope most of you remember. Um, it was torn down in 2003. So if you moved here after that, you wouldn't have known this school. So. Okay. In 1851, a group of people met together at Mr. Windergate's house to decide on building a school for the area. And it was called a fractional school, fractional school number six, because it included children from Waterford, Pontiac, West Bloomfield, and Bloomfield townships. And, and that's why it was called a fractional school. So they met in, in December, and they decided they would like to build a school for the children in the area. Now, how did those children get to school? They walked. And some of them, if they came from Waterford or Pontiac, or any of those townships. 1851. <laughs> no buses. I think that some of them might have come on a horse. And some of them might have been brought to school on a horse, in a horse and buggy. My mother lived up in the Thumb in a little town, and she, they went to, right across the street to a one-room school when she was young in, in primary school. But when they had went to the high school in the city, in, and not in the city, in the little town of Croswell, sometimes a stagecoach would stop and pick them up and take them into school. So this is 1851. This, the area is not even settled yet. But I'm going to show you some maps. So this says fractional school number, number six. This is Daniel Whitfield, and he is the one that donated the land to build the very first school. And he was born in England, and he came to the United States and settled in what is now Bloomfield Township. I'll show you where. So this is an early 1857 plat map. A plat map is, will tell who owns the property. D David, tell me if I'm wrong. OK. David's another historian. So you can see David Windgate's name is up there at the top. And down at the bottom is Daniel Whitfield. It's just D-A-N, Whitfield. And then you'll see that um, in the left-hand corner, the slash, the lines that go through, that's where the school was put. That's where it was built, in that triangle of land. But this goes back to 1857. Aren't we fortunate to have this information? So this one is from 1872. And you can see there is more development. And I believe that that road that goes on an angle and then goes down by Square Lake, I think that is probably Ward Road that is still there. And, but there's that triangle piece up in the left-hand corner, and that's where the school was. And you can see Turtle Lake. And what about Lord's Lake? Anybody know where that is? That's right. I'll show you what happens. So this is 1898 and 1908. And you can see it's still um, Lord's Lake in both of these. 
And then, uh, and you can see Square Lake, you can see more people own these pieces of property. So it's becoming developed in this area. Because this was wilderness. So now, this is 1920 and 1930. And this is when it, is, it changes from Lord's Lake to Hammond Lake. And Hammond Lake um, was named for Mr. Hammond, who developed the refrigerator railroad cars where they could ship meat from one part of the country to the other. And he, uh, and he must have lived there. I, he didn't, wasn't living there when, then, when I was there, then I, since I've lived here. But you can see up there in that corner, that's where the school was. So you can see how much development has gone on. See where it says Mary, K, Mary Day Wade, Wade I, Ward. And look how in 10 years, the development. And you know where that is now? That's Ward's Orchard. Right across Orchard Lake Road. Like if you go up um, Pontiac Drive, you cross over Orchard Lake, you go right into Ward's Orchard. Those children also went to Whitfield School. And this is 1947, uh, which is our most recent map like this. And um, you can see it's even more and more developed. And it wasn't too long after this that Washington Park, do you know where that is? You know where um, Home Depot is? It's the, develop, it's the um, subdivision across the street from Home Depot. And then that was in 1952. And then in 1954 is when um, Sylvan Manor was developed. So all of a sudden, there was a big booming um, population growth. And we needed more of a school for the children to attend. So I put this in because this kind of shows a configuration of where the school was. The, school, the first school was down in that triangle piece of land right there in the bottom right. And if you can picture the fence that goes along um, Detroit, Edison. Detroit Edison, thank you. <laughs> That's where that, um, that school was, was right there. And it was called Orchard Lake. Um, gravel road at that time. It was not paved. In fact, I think we might have even been in high school when that was paved, when Orchard Lake was paved, or maybe before that, it seems like. This map shows the Detroit Edison. Actually, it was in 1930. Um, you can see it on the, where that slash is, but up there on the top right. In, in the 1930 map, it shows the Detroit Edison. So that's been there almost, that's been there 90 years, wow. which is, I had no idea. Isn't that interesting? That building looks really old. Yeah, that building looks old. Yes. And it, I'm, I'm, I, I, it's, it's always been there like that as far as I remember. Is Orchard Lake Road in that, in that view? It doesn't make sense because they got Square Lake Road coming into it. Yeah, that. The one that goes down and then up again, I think it, oh, I see, it does say Square Lake. Yeah, yeah it's kind of strange. It doesn't make any sense. It's there. Ward Road now. It's Ward Road. Well, Orchard Lake should run kind of like, not true north and south, but, um, oh, well, see where Hammond Lake is? That would be Middle Belt going north and south right there. So Orchard Lake would go in the other direction. OK, this picture shows that where the first school was is in the triangle. Then the, th the third, the, well, the third school, that's what this is a configuration of. The, the buildings that go straight across the front are where the original school was. It, on the left were the first, second, and third cla grade classrooms, and on the right-hand side were the fourth, fifth, and sixth grade classrooms. And in the middle was the office and a clinic and the bathrooms, the restrooms. Then, two years later, after the school was built, they decided to add on two more classrooms and a big gym, a beautiful gym. And that's the part, the long part, um, 
kind of in the middle. And then after these other two subdivisions started uh, sending kids to Whitfield, that's when they had to add on more and more classrooms. So the building on the part on the left is where the classrooms were. And there was also a um, cafeteria, or not, a lunchroom in the basement. Uh, and they had lots of meetings there. And it was like a community room almost. So this goes back to the very first Whitfield School. <clears throat> this is the only picture, and actually, David Walls found this picture <coughs> on eBay, right? Or no, it's at the history center. At the his oh, um, Okay, it was at the, uh, they had a picture at Oakland County Pioneer and Hist Historical Society. <coughs> so th they said that when the men, when the people met to decide on building the school, they said they would spend no more than $300. They had to paint it white on the outside and drab on the inside. <laughs> Doesn't sound very conducive to learning. Uh, it had one door, it did have windows, and the first teacher was um, Mr. Rod, and he made $17, um, $18 a month. And he had to, he, his teaching days were 24 days out of the month, and he had a choice of teaching every other Saturday or every other, uh, in the morning or every other Saturday. Every, every Saturday morning or every other Saturday afternoon, or all day Saturday. So that building was there for 42 years. And remember, they, they built it for $300. So. Can I ask a question? Can I ask a question? After that was, when they built the, the Whitfield School, This is the first Whitfield school in 18... I'm talking about the old man, Mr. Whitfield. Oh, yes, he was, yes. Did, did he actually build a new school? Or did the people from Sullivan build it? Oh, the, the last school? Yeah. The last school was built by people from Sylvan. So he was gone by then? Yes. He died in um, 1998, I believe. 18, 1898. Actually, he lived... Six, no, Yes. The first and second were together, and the seventh and eighth were together. Yes. So it was kind of a funny deal. Mm -hmm. Right, and well, I'll get to that when I talk about the last school, but this is the first one. Yeah. So this was there for 42 years, and then they decided. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> oh, oh, which one of the kids is. <laughs> Yes, very good. Oh my goodness. So, um, where was I going now? The, um, oh, the, about the, well, after 42 years, then they decided they needed more room and um, they built, they decided to build another school. And so, but they sold this one for $13 to Charles Hotchkiss. <laughs> Isn't that funny? So, this is a map that is actually at the Bloomfield Township City Hall, or city complexes. It's a huge map, and this is just the Whitfield part of it. But it's, it's such a beautiful um, picture of the way it was back then, with all the trees and the farmland and everything. So, this was uh, painted by somebody in 1928. So, and this is, this is the Pontiac High School that was built in 1871, and it was there until 1913. Isn't that amazing? So the kids would have to pay tuition that lived in this area in Sylvan Lake. They would have to pay tuition to go to high school because the, the taxes only covered Whitfield School at that time. So I think this is a really beautiful building. And I th that might still be standing. Is this on? No, it's not. It's not standing, no. OK, there is a fancy building across the street from the old high school. But that's not the same one. OK. 
But this is a high school that I went to, and Ruth Anderson went to this high school, and we graduated. Wow. Yes. It was a beautiful building. It was very similar to the last Whitfield. It was. Well, unfortunately, that's another one that's gone. So it was a beautiful building. It was three stories, had wood floors, lots of beautiful wooden uh, woodwork, um, nice big classrooms, nice big windows. Well, I'm guessing that it was built right after, um, uh, like 19, let me go back, 1914 maybe, or 1913, because they needed a place for the kids to go to high school. When did it close? What year? It closed in... 1973. I was the last class to graduate out of the old building when I was there my senior year of high school. The building complex that is there now, that was already in the process of being built. My senior year of high school. So then in 1974, the first class started in that building. And you know what is there now? It's on here in Street, or M59. Um, you know where the railroad tracks are, and you kind of go up the hill. Um, and it's a very modern, extremely modern structure. Half of it is below ground. It has now been sold, and it is... Lee, Lee, Lee Construction owns that building now. So um, it's not a school at all anymore. And it was... Well, I won't, I won't go into that. But this was a... This was a beautiful building. It did have a swimming pool inside. It had a beautiful um, auditorium. Um, we, had, we did have to go to Wisner for the uh, football and track, and, uh, which is out. Um, <laughs> Oakland, Avenue. Oakland, Oakland Avenue. <laughs> um, so, um, but, and, we, and even as Whitfield students, we went out there and they had a whole school, uh, the, all the schools in Pontiac went out there and put on a big program when I was in grade school. And this is um, the late Jim um, Durfee. His son was actually in my class. And he used to take the inner urban. You know, the inner urban used to go right down Garland he would stop, at the, this is at the corner of Oakwood and Garland, he'd stop the train, they'd, they'd pick him up and they'd take him to high school. So this is the second school that was built on, this, on the Whitfield site. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. Wouldn't that be lovely? That's a, it's a cottage style school and it was just lovely. And it was there until 1926, from 1894 to 1926. And then they, well, I'm going to tell you, as that is, but I want you to look at this picture carefully and see if you see anything that's unusual. The tower behind a car, the vehicle. The vehicle, yeah. The tower. The what? Yeah, that's a bell, and that's the only thing they saved from the first school, but I have no idea what happened to it. Anything else? Very good, the smokestack behind it. And look what else is across this way in the behind. That, that's, that's called an eyebrow window. And they had already started building the third school when this one was still up here. So that is, uh, this shows us a progression that they were always forward thinking to build, to put in a new school. How many grades were in this building? Well, I'm, I'm thinking K th kindergarten through eighth. It looks awfully small. Well, let me show you. There were, they did add on. They added, oh, there was so like a, like yeah, there's, so this is another picture of the same building. And this is another one where you can see the whole thing. So they did add on to this one as well. Was this all on the property up there? Yes. Isn't it too bad? Yeah. And I just, well, I won't go into that now, but we need to start doing something in Sylvan Lake about our 
building ordinances. It's really getting to be awful. Anyway, this is Charles Fisher, who was the architect for the third Whitfield School. And he lived on Oakwood. If you know where Barbara Ash lives, he, I'm pretty sure that that's the house that he designed for himself and his family. And they lived there because it's a unique house. And, it's, it, and it looks like an architect designed house. Um, Barbara Ash lives there now, but it used, um, one of the Whitfield teachers used to live there. So he designed that. Oh, it is. I'd love to live there. <clears throat> well, the other thing that uh, Mr. and Mrs. Um, Fisher did was to commission the um, painting of Mary and her little lamb. And I wonder how many people know where that painting is. Where is that painting now? City Hall. I asked somebody yesterday, and they had no. I know. I wanted it to be in this building. But they said too many other activities go on here. And some, it is an original, and, and I'll tell you how it was saved. But he and his wife commissioned this for $200 right before the school was built, before the, the third school. What can you tell me that you look, that you see here? City Hall. Same architect. The same architect. Good for you, Christine. Charles Fisher also designed City Hall in 1929. Isn't that fabulous? And see how many similarities there are. The eyebrow windows, the peaked roof, the fancy stuff at the top. Um, anyway. Isn't that neat? So, you know, they, at the last council meeting, they talked about moving City Hall down here. So I rushed up to, Don, to um, John Martin. I said, what are you going to do with City Hall? We can't lose that. He said, oh, it'll be for the police. So they're not planning to tear that down because we cannot let that happen. That building is almost, that'll be 100 years old in 2029. And it's a charming building as far as I'm concerned. But I like old stuff. Historic site. Yes. yes. It's not allowed to be torn down. Exactly. Right. But they're doing it. I know. So this is the painting that was, that was commissioned by Mr. and Mrs. Fisher to be hung in Whitfield School in 1929. And it was painted by Roy Gamble, who was a famous Detroit artist and painter. He studied in Detroit. He studied in Paris. Um, in fact, he even lived here in Sylvan Lake. You might know Shar and Ken Gamble. Um, they lived down here on the point, and um, Roy Gamble was his uncle. Was Roy was um, Ken's uncle, so he did uh, he did live here for a time in Sylvan Lake. So he painted this picture on canvas, and then they stuck they glued it to the wall over the fireplace in the kindergarten room. It was kindergarten at that. It, it changed classrooms later on. But this is the way it looked when I was there. Isn't that charming? Yes. So this is Mr. Whitfield, Mr. Um, Houston who was the principal at Whitfield when, when I was there. He, he was the principal and the superintendent and a teacher for 20 years at Whitfield. A wonderful man. Wouldn't you, at, Mr. Houston. After Pontiac, after, after Whitfield joined Pontiac schools, they sent Mr. Houston to um, Wilson School because they needed to discipline those kids. And he did. So anyway, back to the painting. It's in this classroom. This is Roy Gamble. He is the artist of um, the painting. And if you know where the Scarab Club is, behind the DIA, he is the first one to have his name, to write his name on the, one of the beams in that building, in the Scarab Club. And you can see that there today. So they, um, after Whitfield was closed in 1991, 
uh, Mrs. Samuelo, who was a teacher in that classroom, tried to get the painting off the wall because she could tell that the school was closing. They weren't going to be able to um, keep it going. They weren't, it was just going to be abandoned, and it really was, which is very sad. But anyway, so she tried all summer to get the painting off the wall. It was stuck with very heavy glue. So she called the um, Greater West Bloomfield Historical Society, and Jim Larriman, the man in the, on the ladder, came with a ch hammer and a chisel and actually hammered it off the wall. They took the plaster with the painting. So they got it off the wall, and then they took it to the museum. You know where the museum is? At the corner of Long Lake and Orchard Lake Road. You must go there and oh, visit. Museum? Yes, it's wonderful. I pass it all the time. Everybody says that. I pass that <laughs> all the time. You must stop in. It has been redone. It is beautiful inside. Lots of interesting stuff. So, um, so they took it to the museum, and I was told that when they would have um, meetings, they would put the, the painting on the floor upside down, and they would, while they were chatting, they would peel off some of the plaster as they were chatting um, for their meetings. So that, um, apparently that did happen. So this is um, when the school is almost ready to be torn down. And this is the fireplace, and you'll see in that dark spot at the top of the circle, that is this picture. And yeah, <laughs> we had a cat, a black cat at one time. Um, anyway, this is Powabic tile. And the man, uh, Charles Johnson, who was the uh, person to tear down Whitfield, took this with him. Because apparently when you are the contractor, this, it, the, the building belongs to you. So he took it with him. I've talked to him many, many times. <laughs> I called him this week. I said, I was willing to go to Powabic buy him a, pick, a, a cat tile, and they've got two choices, two different colors, and they're really cute. And I said, I'll trade with you. <laughs> he still won't budge. So if any, in fact, uh, Mike Grasser, I have to talk to Mike. He knows Mike Grasser to see if Mike can twist his arm. Because wouldn't it be nice to have that as part of our archives in Sylvan Lake? It's just little. It's probably a four-inch square tile. I'm still working on it. I haven't given up. At least, at least this time he answered the phone. So, <laughs> so then, um, about um, in 2012, 10 years ago, the Historical Society decided they didn't want to have it on the wall. It took it's five feet square, about, and they it's taking up too much room on their wall. Would we like to have it in Sylvan Lake? Oh my gosh, my hand went up. <laughs> so we raised $3,000 in donations from uh, retired teachers, from former students, anybody that knew anything about the painting. It was wonderful to see people uh, uh, donate toward the restoration. So then I got, for, well, before that even, we had it, I had it appraised by Dumas and they said it was worth like $400. <clears throat> well, it's like 4000 to me. But anyway, um, they, um, so then we called, then I called three restoration companies to see about restoring the painting because there was still the um, plaster on the back and the black plaster was harming the painting on the front. So I finally settled on Mr. Ackerman, Alfred Ackerman at the DIA. And he came out and that's, there, you see on the left is the picture in the museum and the one on the right is at the DIA. And he's, it was about a two year project and, um, and we were really thrilled to have it back. So after we got it back, then we had uh, Ron Gay make a frame that looks like the, the frame in, that looked like the frame in the school. 
and it's now it's on the wall in City Hall. If you go in the front door, not the side door, but it's the front door, there's a few steps, and it's right there on the wall. I have to take a look. I was just there the other day. I just uh, somebody told me that yesterday. They go in the City Hall, but they don't see the painting. Good. It's there. I know it's there. <laughs> so what? Well, it's now on the wall. It's it's there. It, and somebody is in City Hall all the time. We wouldn't want somebody <coughs> to um, harm it down here. So anyway, we are thr thrilled to have it back in Sylvan Lake. This is a picture, I think, of possibly the whole school in 1935. See how many children were going to Whitfield way back then? That's amazing. This is what our classrooms look like. They all had blanket of a wall, uh, windows on one wall. These uh, have a desk like this. This could have been anywhere from um, third grade up to sixth grade. This is actually my mother in her fourth grade classroom. Your mother taught my mother taught for 20 years at Whitfield. <laughs> and this is another classroom full of students. And this picture has our friend Paul in it, doesn't it? Paul Bachning was um, one of the basketball players, and they won the city tournament. Class C. Oh, sorry. Well, that was because of the size of the school, right? Oh, <laughs> I hope you still have it. And this was the girls' basketball team. Wow. Yeah, I mean, that was really something. Yes. This was K through 8. This went through 8th grade. And this, Paul's in this picture, too. He's the man on the left. Top left, right? Yeah. With the shiner. With the shiner. <laughs> he, he can, I'll let Paul tell you about that. <laughs> <laughs> These are some kids playing in the, on, on the playground. This is probably back in the 30s by the way they're dressed. Isn't that cute? This is a slide. It was very, very, very tall. And actually, they brought it down to the beach. It was at our beach for quite a while, too. And it was kind of dangerous because it was so tall. <laughs> this is a picture of all the teachers, I think there's except for one, that we had in, at Whitfield. And this picture was sent to the men in the service. And they, were, they sent each of the men in the service in World War II a, a Christmas card. And it had six pictures. And this is one of them. And I will show you the rest in November. But um, because they wanted them to remember home, what it was like living here. And this picture certainly would do it. Now, the man on the left, anybody recognize him? Gilchrist. Mr. Gilchrist. <laughs> he was a custodian all the time. I think he was there until the school closed. I don't know for sure. But he would come to school dressed in a suit, and then he'd change into his work clothes. And it was so funny. But, and, the, and the principal is behind all the teachers. That's Mr. Houston in the middle behind the teachers. Isn't that funny? So this is a boat, that SS um, Ford, that they, um, Henry Ford, that they, the kids built as one of their activities at school. And this is my first grade, second grade class. And Sharon is this, and Karen, I'm in that picture with a brownie cap on. Oh, yeah. oh, Helen yeah. Jane is on the front row, third one from the right. Oh, how cute oh, is that? In my brownie uniform. <laughs> Let me show you what we do now. Here we are. We keep in contact from kindergarten and first grade. We Zoom with each other on our birthdays. Wow. Isn't that neat? How many friends have you had for over 75 years? Yeah. <laughs> and 
And then Karen came all the way from Tennessee to be here tonight. Wow. That's... And her husband, Jim. Thank you, Jim. And with the driver. Okay. Then in 1947, with, uh, this is when they decided to join Pontiac Schools. Um, before this time, they, the children would have, they, they weren't children anymore, but they had, would have to pay tuition to go to Pontiac High School. And the, the parents in Sylvan Lake and Ward's Orchard and the area were paying um, taxes for their school. But this would be above that because we were, we were still a fractional school. It was over a, almost 100 years we were a fractional school. That meant we were our own entity. And we, um, so th then they had to make a decision. So they decided to take a, take a vote. And um, let me see. Oh, maybe I don't have it in there. Anyway, not everyone. It was 209 in favor of going to Pontiac schools and 113 against. So it wasn't everyone that wanted to join Pontiac schools. But let me tell you, how many schools were in West Bloomfield at that time, in the 1940s? There, there were two. You know where Roosevelt School is? Roosevelt was kindergarten through 12th grade. Was it called Roosevelt then? Yes. And that school is 100 years old. There was a Scotch school. Was, uh, you know, there's a new Scotch. But on the right-hand side, right there on the corner, is the old Scotch. And that one was uh, my aunt taught at that school. And that was the other school in West Bloomfield. So they really, and Pontiac was bustling. There was, and they, were, they had many schools. So it, it made sense for Sylvan Lake to go with Pontiac. And this is a picture of um, a little girl sitting, right in front of that little girl would be where the train went by. And so those posts were set there so you could not run in front of the train tracks because the train was still going, the regular big train. And this is my mother walking across the playground. My mother walked back and forth to Whitfield for 20 years. How far was Whitfield from where you lived? Oh, I, maybe half a mile. But my, we, that was one of my favorite memories, and Sharon would remember. Sharon just lived right down the street, and we would meet on Maplewood and Inverness, hanging on to my mother walking to school, the poor thing. We walked to school, for, and we got there. School started at 9 o'clock. We got out at 12 to go home for lunch. We walked home for lunch. 1 o'clock, we were back in school, and then 3.30, we were let out of school in the afternoon. But my mother walked all that time with us. Amazing. Pardon? Uphill both ways. <laughs> In the snow, in a, yes. Okay, now I'm going to tell you about the, the principals at Whitfield. This is our dear friend, Mr. Houston. He was there from 1927 to 1947 um, until they joined Pontiac Schools. And we actually live in his house, which is just a thrill for me. Your house belonged to him? Yes. And his daughter grew up in our house. So, and she, since, um, since I started doing this, she sent me a lot of original photos of classes and um, pictures from the school. And I'm going to tell you more in November. I'll tell you at the end what that's all about. Jeez. Then, in, uh, then <clears throat> they decided to send Mr. Houston to... Wilson School to straighten those kids out, and Miss Luther came to be in, at Whitfield. And we, Sharon and I and Maureen, we used to go and visit her in the nursing home before she passed away. She, she lived to be in her 90s. So, we, did she we, ever get married? She did not get married. She was missed. Yes, yes, she did not ever get married. That I, no, I'm sure she didn't. She had a sister that did get married, and they were both teachers or principals, but she did not. And um, anyway, this is Mrs. Walker, who was the next principal. And, and I really had thought that Mr. Neff could be here tonight. He just had back surgery, and he's 90 years old. But he was the principal 
when my kids were there. Uh, such a great man. And, and also Mr. Cole, uh, Caldwell was there when our kids were there. And Mr. Colbert and Don Ostrander. Now, I did talk with him. Oh, I'll tell you that in a minute. Oh, and then this is a very, this is all the staff that was still at the school in the la very last day the school was open in 1991. A very sad day that they were going to close our beautiful school. But this, this is something kind of fun. This is not actually related to the school. But we had a, a DPW man, man um, who's um, looking out the window of the truck, Clark Green. This man did everything. He plowed the snow. This is when we had dirt streets, so he would um, use a, the grater, and then they'd, they'd put down salt or... Um, oil so that the, the, the dust wouldn't fly up. He collected the, the trash. He mowed the lawn. He did everything. Nice, nice man. So he decided, oh, and he was a policeman. Yes, because he got after you and I for driving We find out all kinds of things at these <laughs> meetings. <laughs> anyway, um, he decided that the boys in, the, in Sylvan Lake needed something fun to do. So on Monday afternoon, they collected all the trash in Sylvan Lake. In this, this is a city truck, like our um, small truck, uh, red truck now. But they collected all the trash. All the boys helped, I think. Then they went back to City Hall and they built these um, seats, I guess you'd call it, on the side and the railing up on the top. And then they took on, off on a trip. This is in 1939. And they decided to go on a camping trip across the state to Lake Michigan. And, this, and Mr. Uh, Clark Green was the, uh, the only adult but, uh, and, and I do have more pictures. I should just have a program about these funny things that happened back then, because uh, I do have more pictures to tell about this. Uh, but it, it was really a fun thing. And we did have scouts. Um, Ray Dahlgren is on the left. Um, you see where the drum is on the left? He's, he's kneeling down, that's Ray Dahlgren. And that's in the middle is Dick Prue, who is the oldest um, life living person in Sylvan Lake. He's lived here longer than anyone else. He lives on Cheltenham. And he, he went to Whitfield and he um, met his wife in second grade at Whitfield. And they, isn't that amazing? Here's a, more Boy Scout activities. Here we are lining up for the parade with the, and here's, this is our Girl Scout troop. Can you that picture? Yes. Um, and then they had a Lakeland Athletic Association. Our kids were played um, t-ball, and they had baseball, football. Um, Dennis Tryon that lived here, you know Dennis, don't, did you know Dennis? Anyway, he helped with that. Here's another um, uh, football team. And then we come, come to a controversial subject. This happened in 1971. This came, became as a federal mandate that Pontiac must bus for integration. There were some white schools and there were some all black schools. And many felt that the kids in the white school were getting a better education. So they needed to mix it up. And this is a, this is a quote from um, Jack Hunger, who lives on Garland. Oh, let me see if I can read that <clears throat> to you. The first year the plan was actually implemented was 1971, my eighth grade year. I recall the National Guard around the bus drop-off area at Washington. That was Washington Junior High. 
and the police abuzz with news and camera wielding types. They'd broken the district into north and south, leaving three junior high schools in each area. Our area where the high school was was Pontiac Central. Jefferson became an all seventh grade school. Washington, where I had attended pre-busing in my seventh grade year, became all eighth grade school, and Lincoln became an all ninth grade school. It was a unique setup that created some interesting challenges. That's young Jack, right? Young Jack, yes. And Jack has lived here all his life, too. Yes. So this is what happened in August before they put this into effect. A group decided they didn't want this to happen, so they blew up 10 school buses. And then it became a national problem, national news. It was an awful thing to happen. So at that point, Whitfield became, every child went to their own school for kindergarten. And then they, uh, Whitfield became a four, five, six grade, class, grade school. And Franklin School became kindergarten first, second, and third. And Franklin is on Franklin Road, north of Square Lake Road. If you, behind Costco, only up further, closer into Pontiac. And that's where Whitfield kids were bused, in the, starting in 1971. And um, this is what, one of the things that happened. 270 residents moved out of Sylvan Lake in this 10-year period because many people did not want their children bused anywhere. So, uh, and this is what's happened in Pontiac. And you can see it still hasn't gone back up to what it was. It was 2,200 people back in 1970. But people, even now, people have to decide if they're willing to, to pay, either go to school of choice in West Bloomfield or another school of choice and I found out that they started that in 1996 in West Bloomfield. They had 40 students um, attend school of choice in the first year in West Bloomfield. And that's still going on. And that's a plus for Sylvan Lake. Because and that's... there are Pontiac kids that also go to West Bloomfield. Yes, yes. So most of the kids, if they don't go to a private school, they go to West Bloomfield, um, a West Bloomfield school, which is wonderful that our kids have that choice. But people had to decide if they're going to move here, knowing that they're, the choices that they had, for the, that they have, they still have. It's still happening. Uh, it, it, actually, it's the, it started in 1970, where it's Davis, this was the lawsuit, <coughs> Davis versus the school district of the city of Pontiac in 1970. They were ordered citywide busing to integrate Pontiac public schools. The first case to extend federal court order ordered integration in the north. Pontiac was a test case, and Pontiac was chosen, and they didn't have a choice. Um, a federal judge today ordered schools in Pontiac, Michigan, a nearby automotive industrial center completely integrated by fall at all levels, student body, facilities, and administrators. That had to happen. So they had to work fast to get this to work. Um, and it was Judge Damon Keith, who just passed away a few years ago. And he was a federal judge, so we just didn't have a choice about it. And it's a sad thing. Um, another um, person that lived here and had um, experienced it is Cheryl Toby. You probably know yeah, Cheryl. Of course. Yes. Cheryl. Um, was bused at the age of 12 to, to um, Jefferson School in Pontiac. If you know where Jefferson is. It's south of South Boulevard. Do you, um, you know where that is? You know, you take Golf Drive and it becomes South Boulevard. Yes. And it's to the right. It's south. Because many of our neighbors, and this, one of the other sad things, our neighbors with kids would move out, our kids' friends. And they would move to an, an area that didn't have busing. 
And the, the kids would, we, were, we actually put our kids in Southfield Christian School. And um, so they would come home from school and they had homework or they had, uh, they were more involved with their friends at school, right, Andrew? <laughs> than, um, than their friends in the neighborhood that they had been friends with. They had grown up with kids and now they're all scattered around going to different schools. That was a really sad thing that I saw happening because they just, um, they would have been lifelong friends. In fact, I mean, they, it's not that they aren't, but um, they still keep in contact. The kids in West Bloomfield, uh, in, on Warwick and Beverly, are in West Bloomfield schools. That happened when Mr. Warwick built that property, those houses, I believe, way back in the 40s. He built all that, those um, houses in the 40s. And we, um, if you remember Jim um, Endress, he worked very hard to get himself on the Pontiac School Board to try to help us get out of Pontiac schools, but he did not win. And somebody did something that, to prevent that. But they want us. We don't have any kids going to school there, but they want our money. Mm -hmm. I sh you know? They won't let us go. No, we can go. Oh, and I, that's another thing. I looked it up on the internet. How many, there, there were 29 elementary schools in Pontiac. <clears throat> Six middle schools and two high schools. Now there are four elementary schools. One middle school and one high school. They really lost their population. They did. Pontiac lost their la population like we did. And it has, in and the, the city of Pontiac, it was a booming city. It, it's our it's our county um, county seat. Yes. So then they decided in nineteen in the year two thousand and three that they had to tear down Whitfield, which is was just John. This is John Martin. This is in one of the in the storage room in Whitfield School. There were lots of books in there. In fact, I have some paper over there if you would like to take some paper that was actually used at Whitfield. I have, see, he's, he's holding, there's some bundles of paper. Yeah. yeah. With Whitfield on uh, It doesn't say Whitfield. It's just, it's, it's like we would have used for printing or handwriting. So, um, but he's standing in this storage car. They, they just moved out of the, the school. They didn't clear it out. They didn't take... The, anything out of it, I don't think, when it ended. Pontiac, I was, I was um, interested at Pontiac Central. They had display cases with all kinds of trophies that the kids had won, and nobody knows what happened to them. It was, they were a wonderful um, sports school, Pontiac Central, Pontiac High School. What are they like today? Are they still a good sports school? I don't know. It's this, uh, the high school and the middle school are out Perry Street, north of Pontiac. So whoever goes there has to be bused to that school or else drive. And there, there's four schools that are open. Um, Owen, Alcott, Walt Whitman, and Harrington are the four elementary schools open in Pontiac. And there's one middle school and one high school. And the middle school and the high school are next door to each other, out on Perry Street. So, okay, so then the decision was made to, uh, and actually, one of the, super, the assistant superintendents had the building sold in 1991 when the school closed. They, they, a private school wanted to buy it and use it for their school. And Pontiac said no, they did not want to have a private school that close to Pontiac. And then it sat there for 20 years. And then it's been 20 years since it, maybe it wasn't quite 20 years, but they, um, then they tore it down. And now it sits there, that property. This is what the gym looked like right before it was torn down. And this was such a sad day. I remember Karen and Barbara and Sharon and maybe more, and we went out for lunch, and Barbara did not even want to drive by the school to see what happened. It was such a sad day. 
We did bring bricks home. <laughs> Lots of bricks. So this is um, the hands of Mr. Um, Johnson, Charles Johnson. And in front of him is the Whitfield Cornerstone. And he, he had taken this with him when the school was taken down. And so he made plans with Mrs. Kennedy, Anna Lee Kennedy, if you, anybody knows her. And she, made, she let a bunch of us know, and we went over there to see what was in the cornerstone. So I have some pictures back in the, in the books back there. So this is the cornerstone. And who knows where it is now? It's at the park. And I'm going to tell you about that. So these are the items that were in the original cornerstone. The, there were documents that go back to 1851. It's priceless. It has all been scanned. I have made copies of all, the, all of these items. And I'm going to put the copies in the, the original cornerstone, thinking that someday in the future, somebody might want to say, oh, is there something in there? And maybe look and see. But the originals are going to be at City Hall in an archival box. Every, I went to Cranbrook. And a nice, nice lady helped me to, to teach me how to archive these items because they are priceless. It's just wonderful that we have this. So what happened was that, that day that he showed us the, the, the cornerstone in the truck, he took it back with him to his business. So I, Anna Lee Kennedy knew Mrs. Smith who knew Mr. Johnson, and the three of us went over to his business, and he gave us the whole thing, the cornerstone and the contents. That's one plus for Mr. Johnson. We still want to get that little cat thing, but anyway. Anyway, um, he was very nice about that. And so Mike Grasser went with his um, tractor and brought it back to Sylvan Lake. And so it sat down here a long, for a long time, and then just last spring, he put it at, in the park. Where's the park? Memorial Park. Oh, Memorial, Memorial Park. park. Oh, that's a nice place. Okay. Yes, and so... No, no. No, we, didn't, we knew we weren't going to leave it there. But it's... Um, so he built Mike Grasser. In fact, the city built six... and dug six feet down to make a good foundation for it, and then they filled it with cement, and then Mike Grasser put the bricks on top that were Whitfield bricks. So it's going to be a seat. It's going to be a place, a bench, for, for you to sit on when you go in there. So it's, and I, in fact, if anybody wants to, I haven't closed it up. I, I have the box at home. There was a um, copper box, copper liner inside the metal, in, inside the cement Cornerstone. I have that at home. If anybody wants to write a note to put in there, do it and, and give it to me in the next few weeks, and I will include that in the, in the, the cornerstone when, we've, when we cement it and put it together finally. So it would be fun. You know, in 10 years, 15, 20, 50 years, somebody might open that and say, oh my goodness, even pictures. Whatever. If it lasted from 1851, well, no, it was actually, I don't know how they preserved these original documents, but the cornerstone was closed up in 1929. So this is what the copper box looks like. It has a lid that comes off. And that's a little Whitfield chair. And these are little, this is a reading circle over here with um, Dick and Jane books. Yeah. And um, those are some more pictures over there from um, Mr. K um, Roy Gamble. And all these pictures and the books. If you, if you want any, a copy of any of those pictures, I'll be glad to send them to you. Just print your name and your email, and I can send them to you. Because they're just priceless. And I have gathered them from all kinds of people all over the place. And then I put them on Facebook, and people tell me, identify the people. Tell me who they are. So I add to it all the time. 
So this uh, here it is in the park. Oh, that's nice. Oh, that's nice. Isn't that nice? Yes. Very nice. So these are some of the things that were in the book. See, this goes back 1852. It had a Bible in there from the Sylvan Lake Sunday School. I don't really know where that was, but it was. Then all, somebody typed all the kids' names, and then I think it was the parents that wrote their name next to it, the handwriting. And then this is on the right-hand side is a list of all the teachers in 1929. And this is some old curriculum that goes back to the 1800s. And more old things. They, even, they had a newspaper. We should put a newspaper in there for, from the day we close it up. And this is the back of the school. Is this the way you remember it? See the path there? That's how we would walk home. And the kids that lived in Ward's Orchard would go across Orchard Lake Road and go down Ward Road and then to their, their own street. But this was a very, very special school. Part of it was that we did not have a community center. We did not have a gathering place like we did, do now. So the school was that for us. Lots of things happened at the school. We had scouts there. We had um, Halloween parties. We just had um, a wonderful time. And we knew everybody in the school. There were about 200 students when I was there. And we knew everybody. You could walk down the hall and say, hi. Mary, and you knew them. So it was just a very special place. So I should stop. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yes, I was going to tell you. This is what's coming up. Uh, oh, I've got oh, something else I was going to This is a list of the very early houses in Sylvan Lake. People are always asking me how old their house is. So this starts in 1900. And you can look on, the, on this for your address and see if your house, how old your, if it's, if, if, if this goes just to 1915. Or no, yeah. Um, but we're going to talk in September about houses by September mail. Or November. This is September. This is at September 22nd. If you live in a kit house, or even if you don't, they're wonderfully built houses. They're, your house would arrive on a railroad car, and it would be in boxes, and you had to, and a manual, and you I had to fig, figure out. Kit houses in my street is one of the yes, yes. There, we have at least 30 in Sylvan Lake. Well, we're going to have a special couple, Andrew and um, Wendy Much who live in Novi, I think that's right, who have done much, much research on kit houses. They know everything. So they're going to come and speak to us. But if, you know, if one of your neighbors has a kit house, tell them, because we want them to be here, and we want them to ask questions. Yes. Or, yes. So, um, and another You know, Sylvan Lake is always in the corner. And this is why. This is a Waterford Township map. And this is Sylvan Lake down in this corner. That's because the four corners come together right here. We, you know, we have that wayside sign right by the trail. And it shows where the four townships come together. So you can look in that. This, this is from the 30s. And I did want to mention this. This is, was in the front page of the Oakland Press, just two, June 28th. This is what's happening at Webster School in Pontiac. Webster School was very much like, Silv what, like um, Whit Whitfield, the same kind of neighborhood and kids and everything. That school has now been recognized as a national historic place. And that would have happened to Whitfield if it was still standing, which is sad. But they have turned their playground into a garden. The building is now a community center. So 
wouldn't that be lovely here? But anyway, I shouldn't be negative. We, we loved our school. It was just a wonderful, and Sylvan Lake, where, why would you want to live anywhere else? So thank you. It, it warms my heart to see so many people. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I, then I didn't tell you about November. In November, uh, the day before Veterans Day, I'm going to talk about Mr. Houston and what he did for the men and your friends, um, Paul, were in World War II. Mr. Wh Mr. Houston wrote to all the men in World War II that had gone to Whitfield, at uh, 45 of them. He wrote the letter to the first letter, Dear Joe Whitfield. I know your name isn't Joe, but it's a generic name for all the kids. He knew these kids personally. One lived on either side of their house. One lived across the street. He knew them. So he wrote to them and he told them what was happening in Sylvan Lake and at the school. Then they would write back to him and he would tell them that Joe was in Italy and Sam was somewhere else. Uh, where they were all over the world so they could keep track of each other because they were such good buddies. So I'm going to tell you about that because it's such a heartwarming story of what Mr. Houston did for the kids. So I'll stop. Thank you. <laughs>